They were dragging their dog to the polls, you know, yep. uh, because they're determined to get rid of Trump. So uh, they made sure that they all ran out to vote this time. It motivated the crap out of voters, I'll tell you. Yeah, horrible. Yeah. What's so, up, hey, hey, Chris. Hey, Orge. Hello. What's up, guys? Shlom had to unmute there. How you doing, uh, Nev, Tony? Good to see you, uh, Ogre. Yep. Everybody calls him Ogre. It's actually well, Orge. I think yeah. in my side streamy uh, one night he actually I went over that. And I think he said that he had done something he was what, what long ago, and originally that's what she was going for. But you don't mind, yeah. what <laughs> Yeah, back when I was like tiny, I tried to spell <laughs> Ogre and misspelled it for like Game Spy for Rainbow Six, and ever since I haven't really cared. <laughs> <laughs> used to be oh, tiny. tiny, so we're well, gonna call him ogre. Yeah, if you want to call me ogre or whatever you want, tiny I'll ogre. Fine. I'll call <laughs> you ogre because that's what you intended. So I call you ogre. Hey, that'll that's work. what I. That's what I. Why didn't either. you just change it? You know, you could have just changed it you because change this it has now. been my online persona. Yeah, for like well, how many people years. know you by that? You know, is there five thousand people that know you by do, that do name? A lot of people call you orgy. I've heard that too. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm not first seeing. I thought Orgy 343. So he's wanting a three on four on three, huh? Okay, I don't know. <laughs> hey, I mean, <laughs> if you watch it. I'm sorry. My no, mind's in the gutter. No, I'm sorry. So, so it's in your mind. Honest guys. atheist. Ogre's honest atheist. Honest atheist. Say it five times fast. Yeah, um, I'd say so. I'd say he's pretty honest. Yeah, he uh, is. Fair I just I just came in to see you know I, I don't have any motive to come in or anything just looking to whittle away an hour or two you know yeah well, well, he's this, a uh, topic is this, so. is this a robot in your 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 icon ogre uh yeah actually this is an image I found way back when that when I first made my channel in like oh four or something like that and I've never been able to find this image to get a non pixelated version of it I have no hmm. clue where I got this from hmm. okay. Because you can barely tell it's a it's a it's a robot, but it kind of looks like one. So yeah. I thought maybe it was. It looks yeah, like maybe a to... giant robot too. Yeah, the the original image is like a MS Paint, but the artist like did that sort of like uh, abstract paintings and stuff like that. I thought it was cool, like middle school, you know. Okay. But it's so it's so it's such low pixel count. It looks crappy if I use it like in my videos. So I'd like a better quality one, but I have no clue who drew the image. Well, you could just consider the pixelatedness of it uh, and the artifacts. I see artifacts, too, from resizing. Uh, you could just consider that the artistic uh, uh, rendering of it. It's, I'm it's more, more it's than willing more to more artistic, that, yes. this way. Yes. Yeah. It's individual. It is uh, more artistic. It is not just a robot. It is a pixelated robot. <laughs> That'll work for me. So I think you guys were talking election before we showed up. Is that or nope? I hate politics. We're not talking election. I hate <laughs> we 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 just made a passing comment about how there is getting stolen from Trump, but that's that's it. That's the end of it. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> I actually noticed knock has been doing like a, a four day um by a, a botathon here. So I just I was like, Nock, I think he finally switched it. It's like if you want somebody to come by and join your chat, take that crap off. <laughs> not even the atheist community wants to well, maybe they do. Wants to talk politics. Hey, yeah, like, well. A, yeah, I was I was hanging over there for a little bit earlier before I came in here, but oh, I'm sure was, I'm sure having fun though. If, if you're, the, I mean, there's if you're going some contrarian Biden. guy in there that's just as <laughs> arguing with everyone, yeah. and it's it's irritating. So, hmm. got to have a little controversy in there. Yeah, if he gets some views, good for him. Well, I mean, there's only so much you can talk about about it. I mean, where they stole it, didn't steal it, it's just gonna play out, and we'll see what happens. But um, I think uh, Trump will um, be funny if he uh, if he does lose, if he gets like a uh, starts a news organization of some type, he could probably probably do pretty good with that. I think. You think, think he yeah. join OAN? I don't know. Because he OAN. seems to really love them. I don't know if he'd, he'd probably do his own thing, but um, 
he, he could do that in a year or two, help them win back the the house, I think, which will, will happen. And then, um, man, I mean, if he wanted to, he's a young 74. He could run again. That's a young you know? 74. Well, I mean, I mean, if compared to Biden, 78, four, I think four years from now, I think Trump will be better shaped than Biden is. If Biden can get in there at 78, I don't see why Trump couldn't. I, <laughs> I mean, men, mentally wise, he seems there. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you don't agree, but. That's why we probably shouldn't be really going into politics. I yeah, mean, I'm, I'm not politics. politics either. So, if you watch him, like just think of him like a stand up comedian, he does pretty good, you know. <laughs> you just throw, throw the politics out. Yeah, I was watching some George Carlin later on this evening before I came on. It was, it was good. Throw, I always me, love so. some of George Car- uh, uh, Carlin. He's, I loved him. Yeah, if you got Amazon Prime, there's like I think 10 or, 10 or so of his stand ups on Amazon Prime. He does have a lot of, uh, I mean, I'll give him, uh, um, he does have a lot of funny jokes, uh, atheistic jokes. I mean, I got a sense of humor, but. Yeah. Oh, so, Jeff, uh, I got got something for you. Go ahead. Um, I'm just, this is a a question. Are you familiar with the uh, mud fossil community out there? Mud fossil? Yes. Are no. you familiar with them? Uh, I'm not, I, I don't think I've ever heard of that. Oh, you're a lucky man. I've been doing a lot of my videos on them recently. It's people that think that like um, like Devil's Tower in, in uh, what's that, in New Mexico or something like that. You know Devil's Tower? They think that's an actual tree trunk. Oh, I, I've, I've heard I, I, one guy in one of my hangouts uh, I think it was some time back, a couple of years ago, I think. Uh, who said that he thought that those uh, those volcanic in- in- extrusions, uh, or intrusions rather, are actually tree trunks? Yeah, they, there are nutters on the earth that actually believe trees got you know hundreds of feet wide. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's it's as uh, a guy mud falls university. If you want a good laugh, he thinks the Atlas Mountain Range in Africa is a uh, dead, decaying dragon. No, my and goodness. The Atlas Mountain Range covers like the northern half of Africa. It's like this this creature is like the size of North Africa. That's great, Scott. How pathetic. Yeah. It's it's interesting stuff. I've heard somebody say once too that the tree of uh life in the Bible in the Genesis creation account was also like that. That it was so big that it reached up into the stratosphere, you know. And I'm thinking, what in the world? Where do you get these crazy ideas? What could possibly make you think that? The Bible doesn't give you reasons. Science doesn't give you reasons. I mean, you might as well just be saying, uh, I mean, you could. I come up with a million things that are just as dumb, and none of them would be supported by anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's just they want that you want to, like, uh, live in this Tolkien world, Narnia world, where everything's fanciful and gigantic, and it kind of... That's my assumption, at least. Yeah, you know, it makes it sound seem more fun if I live in Narnia. So I'm going to pretend like older. Yeah, like well, Narnia. you're probably right. That's probably exactly what it is, Ogre. They need to to live in a fantasy world instead of the real one for some reason. You're probably exactly right. They substitute the real world for this fantasy world. Somehow it helps them some way. Yeah. I think you're right on that. That's a good psychological uh, analysis, I think, of, of those people. They, they think you're right on the money. Yeah, but if, if you ever need a, a good laugh, go look those guys up. That's Well, they're just as bad as flat earthers, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, there's speaking a, of flat earthers, let me, let me show you something. There's a debate going on. Aaron Ross debating some uh, flat earther. Uh, yeah, we, Nathan Thompson, yeah. yeah. Is any good, though? Sorry, well, it's going to be the usual. Trash. This is a uh, here's a screen. Uh, this is a, a YouTube page. I got it open in another browser. There you can see uh, it says "Winner Take All" on modern day debate. R and Raw is debating a flat earther. So, yeah. so because R and Raw is too afraid to debate young Earth creationists that are well informed like myself, he's resorted to really now what he does is debates nutters. Like Ain't that flatter. something? He'll deba- that, he'll do that. We won't debate has you. Has he huh? gone downhill or what? Yes, he's scared to debate you. He, I'm gonna keep saying it. <laughs> oh, of course, he's terrified. Like standing for truth, said he was terrified. Of, it. of course, I, I agree. But so this is what he's been reduced to, because he's afraid to debate people like me, and now he's just he's debating nutbags like flat earthers. I mean, 
Wow, talking about going, you know, a downhill slope, man. Where's the Aaron yeah. Raw that we knew that was so bold and, you know, abrasive and so uh, so eager to, to refute people about things without sitting behind a, a, a mouse and a camera? You know, on his computer in his basement somewhere. I'm going to tell you, even though it is true, <laughs> you're wrong. Do you know what that <laughs> flat earth is famous for? <laughs> no, what? Uh, that particular flat earther uh, was, I believe, arrested because he went to elementary school and started yelling at the kids at the playground to believe in the flat earth. And he scared the kids so much the cops had to show up. Oh, my gosh. This guy's yeah. got and psycho like, he, problems. He live streamed all of it and thinks this is something like to bolster his case. Like oh, the man's keeping flat earth yeah. down. Yeah. Oh my gosh. The guy's got mental issues, man. Yep. He's, he's, a psycho. he's something else. Wow. The guy's got psychological, deep rooted psychological problems, man. He really is a conspiracy believer then. He thinks the whole, oh, he's, oh, you know, he thinks NASA is lying through their teeth. You know, we're going to make the world think that the earth is round. <laughs> I mean, what is the motivation for that anyway? What are they going to get out of it? What would they get from it? Millions and millions, billions of dollars? You know, some kind of control over the people? I am a flat earther. We live on a flat earth. It's true. I mean, what if the world was brainwashed to believe that? How would it benefit anybody? It would probably... It would actually make doing certain types of science more difficult, must, maybe impossible. And certainly uh, astronomy and cosmology. I mean, why would you even believe that there's a conspiracy? What could be the motivation? You know, you have to wonder. Yeah, you, you use that as an argument a lot, and you get your classic uh, conspiracy response of money and power. And apparently oh. that's the entire conversation in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah, so you get and money power. and power for making people believe the earth is flat somehow? How's that work? <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. I don't know, man. Is there a flat earth tax or something? A round, you know, round earth tax? I don't know. Uh, crazy, man. <laughs> crazy. You believe the earth is round? Well, uh, yeah, of course I do. That, that'll be uh, $200. You, you owe the government $200 for that. On your tax return, you know, flat earther or round earther. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> deduction. You get a deduction. You, 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 you know, if you're a round earther, check here. <laughs> a deduction for believing the earth is flat, right? Yeah, I got. Uh, I stopped watching uh, flat Earth debates probably a good half a year ago because they're super repetitive. It's I've only, only watched uh, maybe twenty minutes of all the flat Earth debates I've ever seen. I've listened to three or four minutes here oh. and stopped, and that was it. I just can't. Do yeah, it. I, you know the entire conversation now. That's all you needed. Well, you know, I, yeah, I looked. At, right. I looked into it pretty hard um, a few years back. And um, oh, no. I, oh, no, no, I didn't look into it like I was like, oh, I think this is plausible. I looked into it like this is. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find something really quick just to just rail on them with. But the, these flat earthers, man, they're hard to they're, they're hard to pin down, man. <laughs> they can ad hoc like nobody. Oh, very, yeah. very true, very true. I mean, you, can you, you think imagine how bad they have to twist science to, to yeah, to believe they that. do. That's sad, but you know, and uh, I love good old Iger, man. But that's the I can I can tolerate him for some reason. I don't know why I can. <laughs> Not just because he's a, a Christian brother. Just I don't know. He he truly really believes it, man. And it's and he says you know it's kind of what led him out of the darkness, so to speak, and um, question to question other things, which evolution. So it brought him to God. So you know, good for that for him, I guess. Hey George, good to see George. Good. Good afternoon. What's it well, like on the upside down side of the world today? Uh, well, it's uh, blue skies with a few clouds. Um, reasonable day. Okay. Reasonable day. How, how are you guys? Oh, we're doing okay in the night over here. <laughs> not bad. Not bad today. Better than I deserve, as they all, they yeah, all say. Are, are, you, are you guys talking politics? No. We decided no. not to. No. <laughs> no I've, been, I've, I've been seeing a lot of... Um, 
Oh, shenanigans, trickery, rigging. What in politics? Uh, going on? No, please. No, no. no. Of that. Come on. That's never <laughs> happened, especially in Philadelphia. That's never happened. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to talk some science with Ogre. Hey, what's up? All right. What do you know about oil exploration? Um, I took a few classes on the subject way back when. I uh, haven't touched it too deep since then, but I have a, I have an understanding of it, sure. I wish I had some of my property. Can, Got some I, friends who are in the field. Can I quiz you? Um, um, I suppose if you want to. <laughs> do, does rock dating come into the equation when you're exploring for oil? Does rock dating come into the equation? Um, I, I never dated a rock myself. I, I usually pick human <laughs> women. Well, but, that's that's but a up, but up, um, Hey, listen, Rockley guys. I'm going to take about a seven or eight minute break. I got to do something. Okay, you we'll guys hold the fort keep down. talking. Yeah, hold the fort down. Yeah. I'll be back yeah. in a few minutes. Um, to a certain extent, I believe it is George. Uh, due to the fact that oil um appears, I believe at certain date like oil isn't necessarily contiguous throughout the rock cycle it appears like similar to coal it appears only at certain ages so you want to look for rocks of a certain age okay next next question can you date sedimentary rocks um the sedimentary rock itself no but you can date the pots there are like a uh if you have like a zircon or something in your uh, okay. shale you can date the zircon okay now do you think they'll go through Millions of dollars of drilling to extract these rocks to date them to say find out whether there's rock, whether there's oil there. What, what, say that again. I, that, that broke up for some reason. Do, do you think they would go to the expense of millions upon millions of dollars of exploratory drilling to extract rocks that they can date to then determine whether there's oil there? Well, rock, uh, taking drill cores is something that's very commonly done in exploration, and those drill cores then go like depositories where many people can use them. So it's right, not I'll, that. All right, I'll cut to I'll cut to the chase, Oak. Uh, in pretty much every educational video that I've seen on oil exploration, the dating of rocks has never come up once as a criteria for exploration. I'll tell you how they actually do the oil exploration. When they, when, when before they actually had seismic uh, equipment, geologists would, would look at the surface um, of the earth and they would look for specific uh, fossils and a chemical called porphyrin. Porphyrin is a, as you, as you might know, is a element of oil. Okay, and then based on that, they would then drill to find out where there was oil there. Now, in in modern in modern technology, what they look at is, is they look at stratigraphy, they look at the properties of um, the uh, the uh, fossil fuels that they're looking for uh, in terms of density, like gas is lighter than oil. And uh, oil actually floats on water. So you'd have densities where you'd look at, you'd find gas, oil, water. What they do with seismic studies now is they're actually looking through these sedimentary layers, okay, sedimentary layers with a cap layer of shale because it's the shale that stops the oil and the gas from seeping out and leaking through, the, through into the atmosphere. So dating of rocks is not considered at all in oil exploration. So you, you ran a lot of stuff time here there. So I'll try to go from where you started and work my way back. When you said, said stratigraphy, that is the organization of the rocks, right? That's uh, here we have a, a, a granite layer. Then we have a uh, nice layer. Then we have a sandstone layer. That stratigraphy in and of itself includes the dates so when they want to let's say look for a certain stratigraphy they hope to find the rocks in they look to the date of the rock as well determine if they would even expect oil at that particular level no no they don't no they well, that, don't the two uh, are interconnected the, the, 
The, no, oil oil is always found in sedimentary layers. Okay, it's uh, it's usually found in some uh, near sandstone with a with probably a shale capping. It's the shale that's that's um, dense enough to prevent. Um, you're talking uh, or, about or, or it's um, very it's very low in porosity. velocity and permeability here is what yes, you're talking about. Yes, that's correct. And that's correct. Porosity and permeability. Yes. Um, oil sits in porous rock, like sandstone, for example, in the same way groundwater sits in porous rock, because that's kind of the only place it can be. The low permeability layers, such as shale, like you said, um, again, yes, prevent the rock from prevent the oil from rising due to pressure differences. But it's not only exclusively shale. Uh, salt domes, for example, can also hold uh, rock. Igneous layers can hold can hold oil, stuff like that. It's not exclusively shale, although it is very commonly shale because shales are super but, common but they, rock. But but they have a cap layer, though, Olga. Yes, they, they all cap have layer a cap layer. Exclusively shale. That's what I'm saying. There's lots of different yeah. shapes that oil wells can hold in. Cap layer is a common yeah. one, but not exclusive. Okay, uh, back to the question. Uh, dating of rocks does not come into the equation for finding oil and gas. That doesn't sound like a question. You got to phrase that form of a question. <laughs> uh, what well, is that was my first? That was <laughs> that was my first question. Why I asked Alex? you whether whether the dating of rocks is a criteria for finding oil, and uh, all all the research that I've done through um, uh, oil exploration companies, they don't date the rocks to find oil. Uh, again. When you said at the beginning, you said stratigraphy, the stratigraphy of the rock is in line with the dates of the rock. All known uh, formations have a, at least a relative age to them. So you no, don't no, look, I, at, you don't no, look no, at 10,000 no. year old rock for oil, even though it may be sandstone with a shale on top. You're not going to look at that 10,000 no, year old no, rock. When I, when I meant stratigraphy, I'm talking about that they're specifically looking for some sort of a cap layer. With a set, a porous layer below it that is like a sandstone. Yeah. Okay. And 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 by doing by doing the seismic studies and looking at the various frequencies um, that are measured, they can detect whether they're going through gas and oil because correct. they would have different different fre frequencies. Correct. Well, they don't have different frequencies. They um, call and response shows up differently. So you well, have. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, what you you're not using the right. You're not explaining it correctly, but your idea is in the correct spot. So yeah. All right. Okay. That's 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 all I wanted to know because um, I've watched uh, dozens upon dozens of videos on, uh, and these are from oil exploration companies on on what they actually look for, and yeah. not one of them has ever mentioned dating of rocks as a criteria to find oil or gas. Yeah. Again, um, in order for you to do the geophysical survey, such as, as you said, seismology, you need to know where to set up the survey. Um, seismology isn't something you can, let's say, do from an airplane like a gravitational survey. So in order to know where to start looking for oil, you need to pull out your geologic maps. And you need to find the oil that you need to pinpoint a general location where you think oil exists. And then you do the survey of that location to find the particular well. And that yeah. first step does involve an understanding of the age of the rocks. Nonsense. No, what they're looking for is uh, uh, specific fossils and yes, because porphyrin. those fossils have a specific age, exactly. No. No, they don't. Because you don't know what the age of the rock is until you actually do the drilling down to, to whatever, what? to, to what, the two-kilometer <laughs> depth where you find the oil. George, you just said they look for certain fossils because those fossils are probably index fossils and correlate with a certain age because oil is not something that is uniformly found throughout. No, the they look for layer. shells, Oga. They should look for shells. How, how is that correlating to a surface fossil? How does that correlate to an index fossil? They look for fossils on the surface. And as I said, also, well, first of all, you you drill for lots of oils drilled in uh, deep ocean wells, and they don't necessarily look for surface fossils for that. But two, that's um, right. That's why they do seismic studies. Yes, they look. Yes. They look. They look for those densities, the density of the gas, oil, and water, the in the pockets of the stratigraphy. Yes, and 
that, I feel like I'm going in a circle here. Um, first of all, just just for your information, shale cap is not the only place where you find oil. Uh, there are plenty oh, no, of different no. ways to trap oil. <laughs> Shale's not the only one. But in you don't find oil wells. Um, let's, let's, let's use offshore oil rigs as an example here. Offshore oil rigs tend to have a, a certain distance from the shore because as you, for example, the Atlantic, the center of the Atlantic is the newest sediment and the oldest sediment is the nearest to shore. Most oil rigs stay within a certain parameter of the shoreline because that's a certain age of rock that tends to carry oil in it. They don't go out in the center of the ocean and look for oil reserves because that rock's too young to have oil in it. Not nonsense. If they don't go too too far out into the ocean because all they find is basalt, they don't find any uh, sedimentary rocks that that far down into the ocean. Yeah, this sedimentary rock, the abyssal plain, is covered in sedimentary that, rock. That's right, because because the sediments are found closer to the shoreline, because that's where the uh, the material that was washed off during the flood would have deposited near the shoreline. <laughs> Can I, can I take, uh, Alex, can I take uh, questions on oil for a thousand to org? Um, yeah. I don't have a it, thousand, but sure. <laughs> um, does it necessarily take uh, millions of years to form oil? Um, the general consensus, to my knowledge, right, and I, I don't work in the oil industry, but the general consensus, to my knowledge, is that it does take a prolonged amount of time and heat and pressure to squish down the carbon into uh yeah at what what at what temperature org uh was the temperature and pressure for oil uh yeah i could tell you i can look it up though can i tell you it's about it's around 350 degrees centigrade where where would you find 350 degrees centigrade uh in in the layering at what depth uh, I went over this in class a little bit ago. Around, you'd find it around I'm about some ten kilometers, maybe. Be my guess. I don't really know. Cor correct, correct. Around ten to twelve kilometers. However, why do we find oil at uh, two kilometers uh, depth? Because oil is lighter than the surrounding rock. And the same reason why magma pushes up through a volcano. It wiggles its way up through uh, porous rock, through fissures and cracks, stuff like that. If you it's been doing that for millions times, of years, why is it still under high pressure? Exactly. Yeah. Because as uh, George was saying, something stopped it from elevating. Right? That's why the that's why some of the oil oh. doesn't keep elevating, right? The, uh, what are they, the oh my gosh, the old show found oil on the farm. Well, the problem with Hills, that is, right? Oh, the hold problem on, with on, that Neff, is, Neff, is Neff, hold on, hold on, Neff, hold on, Neff. In in every case, uh, or, there are fault traps, anticline traps, and salt domes. In 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 all cases, you'll find some kind of a crack or a fissure. Yes. And in the case of the and in the case of the salt domes, you'll find a bent uh, rock layer above it. If if that for that rock to bend, it, you would have to go at least. I think it's around. 13 to 15 kilometers to produce the 450 degrees centigrade for, for, for the rock to be ductile enough to bend without fracturing. Right. Okay. And, and that's, that's, uh, and that's why if it was millions of years that they, that would have, that would have cracked and all that oil and gas would have leaked to the surface. Well, not it only the underground because of plate tectonics itself, the, the rock is not, solid everywhere inside the earth there's millions upon millions of fissures all throughout the the rock strata in uh, the rock inside the earth and and if the oil can seep if it's under high pressure it's going to go through those fissures even a fissure no wider than a fraction of a millimeter will relieve one heck of a lot of pressure over millions of years yeah correct <laughs> Well, again, it's you gotta look at this at a case by case basis. Are there examples where the oil is leaked out? Yeah, definitely, right? That's what the, the Beverly Hillbillies is what I was thinking of. That's what the Beverly Hillbillies found, right? Oil seeping out on top of the surface because <laughs> it broke through. Uh, but not all oil does that. 
You have yeah. ice lake. Yeah. Is, that's why oil is now a renewable resource. Beverly because Hills it's only amount of it, didn't take a, it didn't take a bullet, though. Well, good for them. <laughs> uh, I thought right. I'd bring that up. Uh, I, I thought a geophysicist like you would have known, but uh, it's all right. Uh, it's it's a probably specialized field. Yeah, I mean, I I, I did uh, oil stuff. Yeah, so my undergrad, I took a few classes in it, but I deviated yeah. away from it because I didn't want to sell my sword to the oil devil. Yeah. Okay. What what they do too is uh, is when they when, before they actually had uh, a very accurate seismic and computerized uh, um, imaging equipment, they they look for surface clues and they drill they'll drill down usually to around two kilometers and they bring up the core, and what they were looking for was hydrocarbons and porphyrin. If you ever find porphyrin and hydrocarbons, you're definitely near oil. Did yeah. you also know that the greatest the greatest deposits of uh, oil have been found near salt domes? In one particular example that they mentioned, they said that they found something like 250 billion barrels of oil at $100 per barrel. You can work out what the value of that one deposit would have been. Yeah, pretty decent chunk of change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I just get fed up by when when uh, evolutionists say that um, you need to date rocks to find all. No, you don't. You don't. And, and as I said, George, it's not that you need to date rocks to find oil. It's that you find oil in certain aged rocks. And I, I just posted the link in the private chat here. Well, uh, Asian rock shows up in the was it? I actually I forgot the name already. What Mesozoic? I think. You you know all that proves uh, yeah, is Mesozoic. that during a certain period of time in the history of the Earth, that's where the oil formed. The flood could explain that in exactly the same way as the uniformitarianist. Exactly. The, the, exactly, the, exactly. the uniformitarian, the, the creationist can say the oil was created not biologically but chemically by heat and pressure uh, dur during, uh, you know, during the uh, enormous, uh, the uh, catastrophic effects of the Noahic flood during a certain period of time over that one year or so of time that the flood occurred. And that's why it's in Mesozoic oh, rock because Mesozoic rock would have been laid down at a particular month during the year of the flood. And so you can take those millions of years, squeeze it down to a year and we have the same evidence. So two questions then, but now proving uh -huh. the time that's the problem. one, how you said it doesn't need, what did you say? Oil? You said oil didn't need, need I, I'm not convinced. Well, it, it's possible in my opinion, the oil could be a product of heat and pressure, a chemical product, and not a biological one. So I where the carbon I have, come? From? I don't think anybody has ever proven equivoc unequivocally that oil is a product of biomass. But it well, may be. It may carbon. be. It's a hydrocarbon. It, so. it may be. Well, I mean, there is a litter of carbon, and hydrocarbon is created by what chemistry? So anyway, I'm not saying I believe it 100. percent I'm saying I'm, okay. un, I'm just saying I'm unconvinced that oil is a product of biomass. Okay, it may be, maybe it's not. And if and if these are the if these are the three criteria they actually look for, they look at density, they look at porosity and permeability, and they look at seismic reflection. Once they find those those um, particular criteria, they then start drilling. And they test the cause for the presence of hydrocarbons and porphyrins, and they usually do it in um, in four four different uh, areas. Uh, the fir the first one being um, let me just find a stratic. It's called a stratigraphic trap. The second one is a um, anticline trap. Uh, the next one is a uh, fault, a fault trap, and the last one is the salt dome. So they're the four, they're the four, four strat stratigraphic clues that they're looking for, right? And then they look, the, then they do the seismic studies to find out 
the the dens the densities and uh, the porosities of the various materials, and then after the the they're sure of that that's when they begin drilling because it's very expensive to drill through rock at two kilometer depth. All right, I thought I'd just give you the benefit of my uh, recent research into into this. <laughs> Thanks, um, Neff. My other question on what you said was. Uh, why could you explain how the flood is able to deposit? I'll just use the geology terms Mesozoic aged um, sediment with heavy amounts of oil, and then younger Cenozoic aged sediment with less oil. Why would why, and then below? Well, Mesozoic because uh, the, 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 I, less oil. I, I don't know exactly. And the oil is mysterious. I, um, I don't think the creationists have all the answers when it comes to oil. Neither do the evolutionists. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think we can, it, it's, it's kind of a mysterious subject to be honest with you. Um, okay. but I think it's possible that the, that, uh, the processes, catastrophic processes of the flood of Noah could explain why oil is at a particular depth and lower because of the sedimentology going on on the earth at the time. The, uh, the, and the, the other, pressures, you know, the, the other clue, Neff, is, uh, it needs to be buried quickly because as soon as oxygen hits it, it destroys the porphyrin, which is the chemical element of oil, and it destroys mm -hmm. the process. So yeah. it needs to be buried quickly. So what buries things quickly? A global yeah. flood, of course, because sediments. there's lots of sediment. Yeah, deep sediments deposited by a and, flood. And, uh, and, a fl and a hold on, hold on. And the flood would then provide that cap, that shale cap, Cap, la uh, cap rock layer uh, mm -hmm. to, to actually seal the whole process. And when you look at the various uh, traps that I mentioned, they, they would all have to be uh, uh, rock hard because, sorry, they would have to be moist because they wouldn't bend there, uh, that way if they were rock hard. Well, it's worse than that, George. It's worse than that. The only way to explain the geologic column is with the Noahic flood. You cannot create numerous strata uh, uh, upon one upon uh, another with fine distinct boundaries in between them with uniformitarian time. The geologic column cannot have been created over vast ages of time because of the clear fine distinct boundaries. If they, they were deposited ever so slowly that it took thousands and thousands of years for each one of these strata to be created, the materials would would gradiate from one into another as one material becomes less available in that environment for deposition and another oh, becomes yeah. more available. It would not create strata where the where one material, it, one strata is predominantly one type of material and it just abruptly, immediately, just completely ends and now you have a new material right on top of it, paper thin boundary. That would Correct. never happen under uniformitarianism ever. Cor Correct. Because because um, some of the some George, of these cap rock layers are kilometers thick. George, um, the I just the link I posted in the private chat. You were saying oil needs to be ten kilometers deep and have super high pressure temperatures. The information. No, no, I'm fine. I'm so, what what did you no, say? No, were you? No, no. What I said. I asked you what te at what temperature does the oil begin to form. And it and, and it, it would form at around about 350 degrees centigrade, and 350 degrees centigrade, in terms of so the, yeah, that's the why I'm temperature asking you because the, the information I'm finding says that that's wrong. I put uh, a, I what, put what, the, what, the information says between 90 and 160 because past 160 it hardens into graphite. At what at what depth do you get do you get 60 degrees centigrade? No, 90 to 160, and about two to four kilometers down. Okay, okay like, like, all right. Can you give me an approximation of depth, uh, temperature versus depth? Um, again, this is going off the sources I found. They both, they're, I got two here, and they're both saying about two to four kilometers down, you get to the temperature and pressure necessary to, uh, Cook, essentially cook the hydrocarbons into oil and natural gas. Okay, okay. Now, now the cap, the cap, the cap uh, layer, which is usually shale, in most of those examples I gave, are actually bent. Okay, and that's what I'm saying. At what temperature 
does rock bend? What temperature does it become ductile? All right, that's a different question. Um, I mean, if you want to do specifically shale, shale. Yeah, whatever. It gives shale. Give it shale. Malleability. Oh, guy just butchered the word malleability. Um, I'm just looking up a quick thing here. Here's another great question. Um, how do we get folded and rolled mountains? If those mountains were never deep in the earth where the temperature is high enough to cause the rock to deform, even slowly deform, how is that possible? Because there are many mountain ranges on the earth that are raised up out of the earth from the surface of the earth, material that's at the surface or very shallowly in the earth and not deep in the earth, like the Rocky Mountains. They're not a product of uh, the, the kind of orogeny that makes mountains uh, where the material is pushed up deep. In fact, no mountain is. But but how do you get the Rocky Mountains when this folded strata in that mountain is the same strata that extends outside the mountain and beyond the foothills to the mountain and across the plains in Montana? Yeah, I mean, you, you, it's I'm the trying, same strata. Sorry, now if I'm trying to look up George's question. There's a there's a, okay, a graph. Just about. There's a there's a graph that answers your question i cannot remember what the name of the graph is to find it uh it's, it's, it's uh, that question it well, explains well I'll, how... I'll give it to you i'll give it to you uh Oga. It, it, the geothermal gradient oh, is, is approximately is approximately 25 to 30 degrees centigrade per kilometer okay now the the ductile zone that will prevent cracking is at around about 450 degrees centigrade which is around 15 kilometers Yes. At 15 kilometers, right? So what I'm saying, we're, uh, I, I don't know particularly in terms of the shale, but the shale, if it was rock hard, it would have to be at approximately 450 degrees centigrade to bend in a ductile fashion without cracking, and that would require at least 15 uh, at a 15 kilometer depth. Uh, the, in, in the global flood situation, we've got we don't have that problem because the the shale would have been would have been moist and would have bent uh, in a moist uh, uh, manner, and there would there wouldn't have been any cracking whatsoever in a in a moist layer. So I looked up brittle ductile transition zone, and that appears to be a zone on continental crust, not necessarily a zone for any particular uh, type of rock. Let me share something so, with you. I think, I think I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet for the most part and let George carry on this conversation with you, but I just want to share this with you. Um, I want you to pay attention to this. I've used this in debates. This is, the, this is from uh, Columbia University. And the reason they're putting it forth is because this is what the scientific community says, and their curriculum is no different from the textbooks at Stanford University or Yale. Okay, They state, under the topic of ductile deformation. Deeper than 10 to 20 kilometers, the enormous lithostratic uh, stress makes it nearly impossible to produce a fracture crack with space between masses of rock. But the high temperature makes rock softer, less brittle, more malleable. Rock undergoes plastic deformation when a differential stress is applied that is stronger than its yield strength, it flows. This occurs in the lower continental crust and in the mantle. Now that's here, that's what I read too, Niff. Yeah. Here is from the University of Houston. Uh, they state chapter ten: folds, faults, and rock deformation. What determines whether rock bends or breaks? They state uh, when an external force is applied to buried rocks under low confining pressure. Now, what they mean by confining pressure is low amount of what's called overburden. That is, uh, materials uh, on top of it, above it. Okay, that creates confining pressure, confines it by keeping it down there instead of letting it uplift. So what they're saying, they say when rocks, uh, when an external force is applied to rocks under low confining pressure, such as near the surface of the earth, the rock typically deformed by fracturing. It breaks. That's how it moves apart. This is known as brittle deformation. At higher confining pressures, in other words, when it's deeper, and you've got trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of tons 
of earth material on top of that, holding it down there. That's what they mean. Um, it will cause uh, to actually flow and deform without fracturing. This is known as ductile deformation, and the rock is said to behave plastically. Rocks under low confining pressures near the surface of the earth therefore generally deform through fracturing and faulting. Rocks deep within the crust under high confining pressures deform by folding. So you have to go 10 to 20 kilometers minimum 10 is, is the lowest estimate that I've seen. 10. Here they state at, at uh, Columbia University, deeper, they say deeper than 10 to 20 kilometers. So you need to go at least 10 miles, probably more. George said 13 or more, and that's probably good. That's probably right. George is on the money. The, the stuff has got to be more than 10 miles down inside the earth before the confining pressure and the heat are great enough to deform it. Otherwise, it breaks. Just thought I'd point that out. This, this was my point, Neff. Uh, if, if it takes... Um... 15 kilometers uh, of uh, overburden pressure uh, to actually bend the cap the cap rock layer and it, and the oil is now found at um, a roughly two to three kilometers that would mean you'd need around 12 to 13 kilometers of erosion uh, considering the uplift at at secular erosion rates that equates to 217 million years of erosion at that six centimeters per 1,000 rate, which they have determined. So something so, something doesn't add up, you know, like it, it just doesn't add up. I mean, their, their own figures state that uh, uh, the entire Earth's landscape should have eroded down to sea level within, I think it was 12 million years. So 217 million years of erosion, yeah, like I said, things don't add up. It's, something's fishy. So um, I was well. I, I've seen that um, sl uh, presentation before now, so I wasn't paying super big attention to it. But I was looking up your ductile zones for sp specifically for shale, and I found a paper where people were doing laboratory tests on shale to see that buildless ductile zone, and they were putting the zone, the uh, brittle ductile transition zone for shale, at around four thousand meters. Not ten, not ten to twenty, because okay, that, so 10 that to contradicts. 20, I think that contradicts well, that the scientific community. Refers, that contradicts what you know, the University of Houston and Columbia University, and you pick a university again. Like that, what Oxford, you're talking Cambridge, about Yale, is Harvard, a reference. Stanford. What you're talking about is a reference to continental crust, granites, very hard sediments. Shales aren't as hard. All the rocks behave differently from one another. That right, the shale doesn't account for. But shale it's accounts the for the crust. tiniest amount of the geologic column. It's just itty bitty little bit of it. It doesn't hardly amount to nothing. But that's what the, we're talking the, about. Shale, shale, shale is 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 just a little tiny bit. The rest of the geologic column is made of all types of uh, olivine and you know granite and, and 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 all types of other rocks. Shale accounts for very, uh, and shale is a sedimentary rock, by the way. Well, but we were just talking about shale deforming. That's what George's whole point was. Okay. And this, but, this, I'll, I'll but, throw the but, paper in the side chat real quick. But that doesn't the change the fact that for the rock. experiments, and okay. they found that around, it says uh, in the conclusion, part two, of uh, 4,000 plus but, or minus shale. a few meters of burial depth is what you need to start bending stuff around. Right around that same depth for oil. To be produced. Who, who says that that stuff is going to bend around at four thousand meters down? Well, that's that's what the paper is saying. Is that the, that's the that? amount of pressure you need in order to be in order to have well, the shale bend but not break to form these intricate shapes? Okay, well, right, a couple of questions. First off, who's saying that? Secondly, um, I put how the much paper can, in the side chat. Okay, how much? Uh, what? What kind of confining pressure is on it? And since when does shale not is, is shale not brittle? You know, shale well, is very much like slate. You know what I mean? You, you, you well, can slate is metamorphized shale. 
you, you can you can split shale into thin layers like slate, and and it's brittle like glass. You know, yeah, it's easily, easily breaks. Any all rocks. Your very argument is that rocks can bend if you push them deep enough. Yeah, deep enough. It, and the scientific yeah, and for community shale, you typically talking, agrees that's shale, more than 4, 10 000. kilometers down. For shale, 4,000. Okay. 4,000 meters. Uh, and so shale, let's imagine that, that, that 4,000 meters down, there's enough heat to bend the shale. Where is that heat? So you find shale where there's magma and it can deform because it's near magma. But where there's not magma, which is almost everywhere else on the Earth at 4,000 meters, it ain't going to deform. It's I didn't say crash. anything about magma. Okay, so, you're, right. You're but I'm just telling you, no sh shale isn't going to deform at 4,000 meters down unless it's hot. Talk about that with the scientists. 4,000 okay, yeah, meters down is hot everywhere. But not hot like enough to I, deform rock because they're what they're saying contradicts the entire scientific community, geological well, community. Oh, sh shale squishes shale can squish into oil if it's hydrocarbon rich enough at like two to three uh, shale, thousand meters. Look, the the bottom line is this: if shale is an exception, it really doesn't matter because shale accounts for probably less than one half of one percent of the whole geologic column. Okay, what at what temperature does uh, shale actually become duct ductile? Uh, this yeah. was just a pressure conversation. That paper refers to pressure, not temperature. Oh, um, that's all right. That's but a, that's I'm going okay, to assume, that's assume point, three though. or four meters are going to hit your like two hundred C area. I'm going to off the top of my head, so I'm going to have to assume that. Well, well, uh, according to to uh, secular science, the geothermal gradient is around thirty. Uh, degree centigrade for every kilometer. So four kilometers or four thousand meters represents uh, four four times four times thirty. It's one hundred and twenty degrees centigrade. So you're telling me that uh, shale will will become ductile at one hundred and twenty degrees centigrade? Uh, according to your math, <laughs> yeah. No, that's, I, I guess no, that's, I, you're that's bringing up things I haven't looked up. Secular, so. That's according to secular. Uh, that's the secular geothermal gradient. That's what they say. You get thirty degrees centigrade for every kilometer depth that you um, you go down. Okay. <laughs> that that's not my that's not my figure. That's that's comes straight out of uh, secular geology. Yeah, I, uh, I, I believe that, that that average geothermal gradient. I have no problem with that. And then yeah. sure, you can have with a combination of heat and pressure, four to five kilometers down, you can get deformation in shale. I, uh, is am I supposed to be not like that, or I'm confused? I go to bed. Soon I just too, find it. Just... I just find it hard to believe. I, I, you, I, I mean, you can find it hard to believe, sure. But as I said, I mean, there is that. I saw a paper in the side chat where people are doing laboratory studies, uh, checking this stuff because it is important for oil, exactly as you said, George. It is important for oil exploration to understand how shale works because it's such a common capstone. So and it, and it's, you know it's exactly right. So that's why people that, that paper is from like I think a few years ago. So there's lots of them. I mean, I didn't even do a Google Scholar search on it, but there's lots of stuff about brittle ductile deformation in regards to oil exploration. These people sold their souls for lots and lots of money in big houses. So so go, going back to the argument that brought, that uh, Neff brought up about um, the various various layers of um, sedimentary. Uh, uh, and, and they're quite very, very thick layers, by the way, including the shale. Yeah. How, why would you think that it uh, took um, millions upon millions of years to generate those layers and only that one material was deposited and not, uh, and not mixed or gradient with other materials? Well, that's a very how, how could that broad happen? question. I mean, you can have – a quick deposition of some sediments and slow deposition of others. You can Could you have something depositing the same for millions of years? Uh, well, we're it's talking possible. about I mean, the, the Canadian Shields. We don't. Yeah, those those are Canadian miles thick. Is... Sorry, cut you off. I apologize. We're talking about layers. <laughs> the Canadian layers Shield that is are, an exception. Are, yeah, we're talking about layers that are hundreds to kilo, uh, to sorry hundreds of meters to over kilometer over kilometer thick. In places, sure. 
How can why, they, why would you think? Why would you think over time, only that one material would have been deposited in that one particular layer? I can't well, understand. The, uh, this. Let me. We're getting a bit it, of I, echo. I'm not sure where it's coming from. Let me mute. Make sure it's well, not me. Consider the picture you're looking oh, at on the screen. Me. These strata are on the surface of the Earth, therefore there isn't, there hasn't ever been billions upon billions upon billions of tons of overburden to compress the boundaries between the strata to make them look like they're paper thin if they originally, originally were gradiated like this on the right. So that didn't happen. The strata always formed, just as experiments in the laboratory prove over and over and over and over and over again since 1952, the strata formed right before your very eyes in the laboratory with fine distinct boundaries, just like what we find throughout the geologic column. Uh, overburden didn't compress the boundaries. So why isn't it gradiated? I, because I it wasn't was laid down by rapidly about. moving water. Now, if the whole geologic column was laid down by rapidly moving water, where's the millions of years time? Because each strata forms rapidly with the one above it and below it. That's the key, key thing. Strata form in groups. They don't form one, then the one above it, and then one above it, and then the one above it. That can happen, but under most conditions, strata form at least two or three or four at the same time, horizontally. This proves, of course, real, observational, testable, repeatable, observable science demonstrates that strata form rapidly. None of them ever have or could form slowly. So if all the strata formed rapidly, how do you squeeze millions of years in between them? Nobody can answer that question. Uh, I've, I've tried to answer it a few times. But you, you and George are kind of bouncing two different ideas at me at the same time. So <laughs> every time George finishes, you ask the question. You know how the like, uniformity is supposed to do answer that? It? You know? Here's how the scientific community uh, answers I'm, it. They say that there was certain strata formed, yes, by moving water, but then there was no more deposition for long periods of time. And then the more strata were formed. So some of these strata were allegedly the surface of the earth. Here's the major problem with that. If that were true, if erosion relatively came to a relatively a crawl, almost stopped completely, then why isn't the surface of the earth, the strata throughout the geologic column, heavily eroded? That's the problem. We don't see the erosion that would take place waiting for the next strata to come along. And this just destroys the uniformitarianists' ideas. There's no way for them to give an account for the strata. It's impossible. So, all right. To go to George's first question, then I'll try to tackle that real quick. Um, we do have examples of sedimentary layers that are very, very thick. The abyssal plain on the ocean bottom has hundreds of hundreds of meters of sediment. And that's an example of something that's been sitting there growing over long periods of time, dropping all this shale and what have you down there. That's an example of a real thick sediment of something that's unchanged over mass amounts of time. Uh, Neff, to what you're saying about the different layers, how can they originate? Well, you just kind of said it already. If you have a time of deposition, then a time of not deposition, you're not going to keep growing your layers. Your house, the ground that your house is sitting on right now is not growing in deposition. This is a pause in deposition where your house is. If a river decides to take over, bash through your house, then you're going to have deposition of whatever the river is depositing. That's deposition and non-deposition. That's where you start and stop these different layers. I, I missed the first part of your statement. There, no. So you're you bro saying you broke up. Oh, so you're saying there were vast periods of time where no strata was formed on the earth. Well, in spot to spot, yeah, obviously. Oh, okay, so your that house means erosion is being formed currently. So wouldn't erosion be occurring for those thousands of years on that? Is there erosion surface? occurring at your house? Well, of course there would be. I'm asking you. Wouldn't it be true then? That whatever whatever at whatever area you're speaking of where there wasn't any strata being formed for thousands and thousands of years, that surface of that landscape would have been uh, subject to erosion for all that time, would it not? 
and well, it depends and, on, it depends and, on the and, location. And, and ground ground squirrels and, and rodents and beavers and badgers digging holes in the ground. And everything that digs a hole, like snakes, not snakes, but like beetles and, and other creatures that burrow into the earth, they would have been doing that the whole time, right? Horses walking in mud would leave a hole, you know, and it would fill in with dirt. And then you could slice the ground where that happened and see it, right? See, where's all the bioturbation? See, it just doesn't add up. It does. You keep add jumping up. around talking points here. Now, if it's <laughs> can you? Ha so you can't answer. For my yourself. argument is: you can have time when there's deposition. You can have time when there's erosion. You can have time when there's neither. You're, you're breaking it, up. It, you're breaking up. Breaking up for everyone or just for George? Just for George, I think. It's probably where he's at. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. You're, you're, you're fine to me. Go ahead. George is oh, on yeah. the upside down of the earth. He's hanging. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's got a bit of a delay over there. The satellites have a hard angle to get to him. And he him. said you have an accent, not not him, by the way. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, uh, but, yeah, in our day-to-day -day lives, I can go someplace where there's erosion. I can go someplace where there's deposition. I can go someplace where there's neither. Those three things exist in our, every single day on this planet right now, and they have existed every single day so, in the planet over its history. So if there was a vast period of time where no strata was being deposited, that surface of that landscape would have been subject to erosion for that thousands of years. Would that not be true? I just gave you three options, not two. So why would it not be highly irregular surfaces if it was subject to erosion for thousands of years? And why would it not show countless, countless billions of examples of bioturbation where a burrowing organism dug into the ground and it was filled in with dust and wind dirt and, and sand i can use an example of sandstone sandstone is commonly associated with like beach sand a rodent or something digs into the beach and when it gets out the beach the hole is then filled in with the sand you don't right, find evidence in. you don't find right. evidence of bioturbation because the sand fills itself back in. Mm, if you go to the beach, you, understand you go to the beach, the beach is. is not full of all these holes. The, the, the world is not beach. It's not made of sand. We're I'm talking, talking about, specifically about sandstone here. Well, we're I'm not, not talking about... The world no, is not a moving the, You're moving the subject when you talk about sandstone. I'm talking about continental material, which is predominantly not sand. The continent is a thousand different rock types. I mean, right. each, each, individual, so, each individual location is going to have its own individual ogre. story. Scientists can dig into the earth and find evidence of bioturbation because they can see the material that filled in the hole is not exactly yes. the composition of the material that was in, into which the hole was dug. Okay. So it's not that hard to find bioturbation. The problem is, where are they all? That's where they are. That's the problem. There's another argument uh, to that too, Niff. Um, I'm not sure whether Ogre knows about fulgurites, but um, this is a nature paper. It's estimated that 864,000 lightning strikes hit the earth oh, every yeah. day. Okay. When, the light, when lightning strikes uh, the earth, it forms what they call a fulgurite. It creates a rock. It's a, it, it's a glass substance. Now, yeah. you could argue, you can argue um, that um, it, it, they erode over time. Correct. But I'm why sure. don't we find any fulgurites in layers apart from the surface and if they did erode why don't we see evidence of erosion in the layers below the surface right and where's all the fulgurites that would have been created just so i don't know 10 to twenty five thousand years ago much less millions well well Neff, i've done younger, the maths here right? i've done the maths here uh, based on the nature figure of eight hundred sixty four thousand per day uh, you, you'd expect something like 7,400 fulgurites on every square metre along the surface. Now, you could argue that, okay, th they, they would have been over, say, um Well, let's say 19th. you exaggerated. Let's say your math was way off. It would still be quadrillions of them, right? Yeah, no, but I'm saying if it was uh, distributed over the 19 geological layers, that's that's still way, way too many. But if you assume... A ten thousand year old Earth, you know why fulgurites are rare because they couldn't have formed at that rate over ten thousand years. Mm. 
So that's another piece of evidence that just doesn't add up with the deep time uh, scenario. Right. So you, you are does. assuming that fulgurite couldn't be uh, eroded and weathered away based on what? Why couldn't weathering no, no, take care of this? No, I'm saying, I'm saying they can, but there's no evidence of erosion in the layers below the surface. You know what, um, what? Uh, Ogre, I, I lived uh, in Vicksburg, Mississippi from the time I was uh, about 11 years old till I was in my 20s for the most part, most of that time. And when I was a teenager, there was uh, some f fields beside my house, the neighborhood where I lived. I lived in a middle-class neighborhood, and there was a, 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 some fields that were fenced off because the man that owned the land would keep cattle in there. And, uh, and I, my, kid, my friends and I used to go play in those woods when we were 11, 12, 13 years old. We climbed trees, climbed the vines, you know, the big vines in Mississippi that go up the side of trees. Vines big around as your, as your calf. And we would grab a hold of those things and climb up into the trees. And we did all kind of stupid, crazy stuff kids do, right? We hung out in those woods for years. I've squirrel hunted in those woods dozens of times. I have seen the landscape of that area change before my eyes over a period of 10 or 15 years when I was a, a youth. I could see that that hill is not shaped like it was when I first saw that hill when I was 11 years old. When I was 15 and I'm squirrel hunting, that hill doesn't look exactly like it did. I knew that land intimately because I went squirrel hunting on that land on a regular basis, almost every other weekend, at least in the winter time, every other weekend, I used to love to go squirrel hunting. And when I was a teenager, and from the time I was 11 till I was 15 or 16 years old, I could see a difference in the landscape of those hills in that field, in those fields, that it, because of erosion, just because of rain occurring so many hundreds of times, the landscape literally changed. I could see that pieces of area were gone and the, they were more rounded out in certain places. If that kind of erosion is happening all over the earth, how do you squeeze millions of years into the surface of the earth? Uh, well, the entire world isn't the same thing as the hill that you grew up next to. Yeah, much I'm, of it is. I believe much the hills all temperate, temperate, and temperate, away temperate, doesn't mean every part of the world is doing the exact same thing. Almost every place between the equator and 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 and, and Montana, you know, it's all eroding the same speed that the hill in your eh, backyard. Was. Relatively, I mean, it's all rained on a lot, especially when you get south. Of, you know, you get below Tennessee and you get above Brazil, from Brazil up to Tennessee. Everything in there gets rained on one heck of a lot. Okay. Okay. That's going to be a lot of erosion. <laughs> I think you're confusing erosion with rain. If it rains in the rain woods, causes and the, the and majority the rain, of the erosion. And the, rain, and the rain gets sucked into the groundwater, it's not moving the sediment a whole lot. Rain causes the majority of erosion, man. Moving water does, yes. Well, rain is, rain is moving the water ground, is, is because of the rain, right? The, you need to have sediment moving for there to be erosion. If the sediment and doesn't move, what happens when it rains? Not all water, not when all it, rain causes sediment to move. When it rains, heaven, you got a heavy rain, water flows, literally flows. Yeah, yeah. water flows. I mean, it flows like crazy. I don't know if you've ever been where if it doesn't rain where you live, but listen, I live in Mississippi, and if we can get some seriously hard rains here, and we get them every year, and you can see that water flowing across a parking lot in a sheet is coming down so heavy. Yeah. So that's happening in the fields, too. And if the sediment isn't, and that for your hill, for your squirrel hunting hill, yeah, I'm sure it weathered down and eroded away. No question. That doesn't did, mean the that doesn't mean the farmer's field across the way had that same level of weathering and so, erosion. So if that's been happening all over the world as it had in temporal temperate zones, which it would have had to have been doing for hundreds of millions of years, in fact, more so, more of the Earth in the past, because scientists universally agree the Earth was temperate. Ever globally, even the Arctic and Antarctic were. Uh, were were uh, warm climate, tropical. 
what? of a whole earth in the past. Yes. Yeah, I think you're uh, confusing. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. So let me help, help you understand something. Scientists universally agree the evidence is clear that even the North and South Poles, the Arctic and Antarctic were globally, were, were tropical in the, in the, during the Devonian. In the early history of the Earth as we know it, according to uniform materials, the sauropod dinosaur fossil was found on top of a mountain in the Antarctic about ten years ago. Ferns are found in the Arctic under the uh, the strata in under the ice. The, they were global. The, the Earth was globally tropical before the Ice Age. Warm climate everywhere. You could wear a t-shirt and swim shorts in the Arctic. Uh, 10,000 years ago or 15 according to your way of thinking all right okay. um so we've moved we've moved topic like five or six times I was i'm just late. pointing out that it's been so okay it's you you keep trying to say well it hasn't really been raining over those places and it doesn't rain so much over here i just hear you digging for excuses or uh, ogre. you you believe it, what you come believe. on man. come um, on you're not really being rational you. here come on man Anyway, okay. anyway. Like a plan. okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming in. I always enjoy talking to you. And I'm glad you came in. And I hope no, you have I, a great I, weekend. I, I like yep. I like the challenge, him actually, Nev. <laughs> oh, another challenge, sweet lord. <laughs> we always love it when you come in, Ogre. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we like you, man. We really yeah. do. We we yeah, just well, want to train your thinking. <laughs> it's kind of like when I go I to Knox Stream. Geophysicist. I come in. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I just said uh, I I like to uh, learn from other people that are outside my area, and and Ogre's uh, geophysicist. So, yeah, well, by challenging him, I'm learning by his uh, responses. Hey, well, uh, what's that? Rising water lifts all boats, or whatever that phrase is. Yeah, rising tide, or whatever. Hey, Ogre, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask you something. How do you, how do you tell female ants from male ants? Uh, the female ants, the queen? I don't know. No, the female ants are the workers, but how can you tell that they're female? Uh, this is going to end in a bad joke, isn't it? I'll tell you. You put the ants in a bucket of water, right? Those that sink are the female ants. Those that float are the boy ants. Uh, yeah, I'm not happy I stayed on the stream for that. <laughs> oh, come on, oh, come on. Got to laugh. Uh, I haven't been a dad for that long to be able to get those jokes. So I... <laughs> hey, by the way, uh, the, uh, the King James Version uh, mentions that the female um, ants are the worker ants, and it's uh, it was only 20th century science that found out that the uh, that the ants were actually the worker ants. So these goat goat herders knew a lot of the stuff 3,000 years ago. If they if they recognised that the ants, the female ants, were the worker ants. Hey, good for them. They were a really boring. Yeah, yeah, very good, eh? All right, take care. Yeah. Good on you, Oak. <laughs>